Amen. What a blessing. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd ask that you turn to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, and we'll begin our reading in verse 7. Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 7 says, As you also learn of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who has declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do cease not to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to the glory unto according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us unto the kingdom of his dear Son. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we praise You and thank You for another opportunity to be in Your house and to meet with Your people. Lord God, we pray this morning that You might truly meet with us, that You would come down and that You would uh, show us our needs this morning and that You would meet with us and You encourage us in the time that we live. Lord God, we pray for the lost, that You might speak to them life this morning, Lord, that You might encourage them. Lord, that You might uh, grant them repentance and faith in Yourself. Lord, we know uh, that You're sovereign and that You can do all things well. Lord, we pray this morning that You would bless this Word to Your own edifying. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Okay, bye. Now, uh, not so familiar verses of Scripture, but uh, been read a, a lot of times. And Paul is uh, concerned and, and encouraged uh, about the church at Coloss. Now, the church at Coloss was not his direct mission, as you'll see, but whether it, rather it grew from another mission that he started, and he just heard, hey, there's another group out here, there's another church out here serving the Lord. Now, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing this morning if, if we uh, sent a missionary out and that church was established and years later we hear of another group that came out of that church and it would be a great encouragement. That's what Paul was experiencing was a, a second generation church, so to speak, and people still contending for the faith. Verse uh, 7 says... As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Now, I want you to see this, that uh, you're responsible to learn. Uh, a lot of people don't preach and teach that today, but it is your responsibility as a believer in Christ to keep learning. Uh, you know, uh, some point people, uh, I believe, have gotten their heads once they learned the five points that they can stop and never have to move forward again. You know what? There's a lot of more treasure in that word besides election and predestination. There's a lot more there for the believer to enjoy and, and to be thrilled about. And uh, we are to grow. And apparently this man... Uh, was very faithful to those deeds. Verse 8 says, Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Now apparently this Epaphras is written back to Paul and he wanted them to know how loving this church was at Kavos. You know, I, I would dare say that's the biggest element missing among God's people today and that is love. And let me say this, out of love always grows forgiveness. Uh, we, we, if everybody don't do every little thing the way that we think it should be done, we get mad and angry and we never have any forgiveness. Now, if that's your situation, you don't have love. And do you remember what the first fruit of the Spirit is? In other words, if you've been converted, 
30, you'll have nine fruits of the Spirit. And the very first one is love. Concern for others. Concern for the redeemed. Not self-righteousness. Not anger. But love for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And love for those people out there. We don't have to put our approval on sin to preach the glorious gospel to sinners. That's a, that, that should grow from love. And we as the Lord's people uh, don't do that enough, but apparently the church at Colossus did. Because of this, for this cause, because they loved the Lord, because they loved and understood the things of God, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Now, all through the church letters, you'll find again and again that Paul was praying for other believers. Now, very frequently, uh, we go through a motion of that. In other words, we go through a little routine of prayer. But you know what? He was getting a hold of God for these little churches that were here, there, and yonder. And he was intervening on their behalf. You know, uh, listen, uh, our type of people is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And you know what? When somebody heads out that door, what nine times out of ten what we do is get mad and get angry and get hurt and never pray for them again. You know what? That ought not to be. That ought not to be. We ought to keep praying for them. If they leave over anger, keep praying for them. If they leave up because the Word of God offends them, keep praying. If they leave over something personal, just keep praying. And that's what we as the Lord's people are to do. And apparently, Paul understood this principle and to the point he got a hold of God. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. Now, he didn't just want them to understand the Word of God and its teaching. He wanted them to be in the will of God. You know, uh, I dare say this, most believers spend the majority of their life simply abiding in the permissive will of God and never in the perfect will of God. And you know what? The reason behind that is this, is because we enjoy sin. Yeah. And, and the ideal perfect will of God is a hard place to maintain. And you know what? Then, because we're not... We want to blame it on God's sovereignty. Don't you ever do that? Because listen, you're accountable for your own service to the King. He, he, he doesn't have a little... You're not a little puppet on a string. He gives you something to do. And if you, can, if you do it, you do it. And if you don't, you don't. And either way, you're going to be held accountable for it. And so we find apparently at this, uh, this church at Colossus, that they were doing what the Lord would have them to do. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, He gives them two things here that, that most people uh, miss. And the first one is wisdom. Now, knowledge is just the base facts. You know, when I was in nursing school, I read about starting an IV. Before I ever attempted it, before I ever looked at it, you know what? I had the knowledge. I understood that it was bevel up, the biggest thing you could find, and go right on in. But wisdom came later. And that was the first two or three I started. And then, here we are 20 plus years later, and I'm using wisdom, not knowledge, to do it. In other words, I can say come out from among them and be separate. But it takes wisdom to do it. I can say love thy neighbor as thyself. And you can get that. That's knowledge. But it takes a whole lot of wisdom to put it to application. And I think that's where we're at today is we have it up here, but we never really emphasize it. But this church at Colossus was different. It was doing what the Lord would have them to do. They had uh, he, he suggested to them to use wisdom 
and spiritual understanding. So they had to be able to apply regular knowledge and then there had to be a role of spiritualness about it. And listen, in the modern day, what I found among the Lord's churches, if anything, is this, is reducing the understanding of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost and knowing what He is conveying to you. Now, let me say this first, and I'm never being contrary to that word, but as I said last week, there's nowhere in that book it says, Larry Lafferty, I want you to preach the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a spiritual understanding that I had to come to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, I, I've heard see, some people suggest, because it was giving credence to the church to go into the, all the world, that every man is a preacher. I do not believe that. Uh, I, I don't believe it at all. Uh, and, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, we must understand and know what is His perfect will for me. And these Colossian believers, that's what Paul wanted to afford them. This is the will. That you might walk worthy of the Lord. Man, that's a heavy topic, isn't it? That you might walk worthy. That, and, and that walk is not simply walking and, and, and moving around. It, it's the way that you conduct yourself. It's the way that you present yourself. That, that when you go to an, a person you've not believed, met before, when you, when you break company, they're able to say there's something different about that thing. There, there's something different about that lady. There's something unusual going on here. That's what we as the Lord's people, that's what Paul wanted for the church at Coloss, and it should be named among us. And, and, and in that way, we present the Gospel that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful to every good work. Now, how fruitful are you? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith. How many do you have? How many is present in your life? And you meet these inter interactions with people and they walk away and they have no idea that you've been converted from the things of this world to the kingdom of God. You know what? That ought not to be. If they can't leave there and know that you've, that you've had an experience with Christ, and listen, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, give them your five points and, and cram it down their throat. They ought to be able to tell it from your conduct and how you present more so than what you say. And so then we as the Lord's people, that ought to be our strife. And that's what Paul wanted for this new church at Colossus was that they would present themselves in that way. Fruitful. And increasing in the knowledge of God. There is never, ever, ever a stopping place. Keep learning. Keep, keep understanding. Verse 11 strengthened with all might. Another thing Paul hoped for this young church was that they would be strong. Now, we live in a day and age today with some of the most anemic, weak churches that I've ever been in. Listen, now, when I get the opportunity to go and preach, I'm amazed at the, the weakness among God's people. You know what? Uh, that's why the Bible says this, well, two or three are together there in my name, there in the midst will I be. And that's three, two or three strong people. People that believe the Word of God. Listen, you know what? It's just like Brother Junior was saying. I am amazed at the people that call on the name of Christ fixing to get involved in the idolatry that's coming up and never ever say one word about it. The weak. And you know what? <laughs> Y'all all know that are my Facebook buddies, I try to preach, uh, I try to post one scripture every, every night before I go to bed. When I, when I posted uh, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 10, the first four verses, I got six likes. And most of you are sitting in this room. Right? You know why? Because they don't want to accept it. Uh, the weak. 
Mm-hmm. That, that, it, it, you know what? And it don't take a, a scientist to pick up on that. Right. They just don't want to believe it. And then, so we then, as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that what God would have for us is that we would be strong, not weak, not anemic, nothing like. You know what? You you know what? He he said the church at Corinth was uh, was weak, and he did say that because they were still on the milk of the world. You know what? You go into the average, and I'll say it, Southern Baptist church. And you know what you're going to hear? Somebody trying to talk you into accepting Jesus. You know what? Whether you accept Him or not, He's still the very King of kings and Lord of lords, and it really don't matter what you think. <coughs> right? And, and so, you know what? And you know, that's a good thing. Preach Christ and Him crucified, right? But you know what? That's milk, buddy. That's just the very base thing that you can know about the, the Word of God. And, and you know what? They lived that way for 90 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, they departed the faith long, 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 long time ago and, and resulted to what they have today. And so that's not what He wanted for Colossus. He wanted them to be strong. Strengthened with all might according to His, meaning Christ's glorious power under all patience and in every fruit of the Spirit, you will find this. Long-suffering. You know what? I don't know when the Lord Jesus is coming again. But I know this. His people are going to suffer for a long, long time. Uh, I'm not here to try to try to minimize that at all, at all. Because if He mentioned it in every church letter there was, it was a reality there was going to be suffering and it was going to be for a long time. Now, in the modern day, you know why that element is missing among many people's churches? Because they've not done anything to suffer for. Right, right. When, when, when you agree to the world, hey man, they're going to they gonna hug you with both arms. But when you say, no, that is not what the Scriptures teach, you're going to suffer. You're going to have problems. You're going to have difficulty. And if you keep doing it, it's going to be a long time that you go that way. Long suffering. And so we, are, we as the Lord's people, we ought to anticipate it if we keep up the faith. And we find Paul talking to this very young church to anticipate it and to expect it and not to be discouraged when it happens. And then, notice what it says. It says long suffering with... Joyfulness. Now, if somebody quits inviting you to preach, well, they just don't like me anymore. I guess I won't teach on on women wearing breeches no more. You know what? If they say, Larry, I don't want you there because I'm tired of hearing about separation, I'm going to be happy. (laughs) Say, well, glory to God for that. That's right. That's what it says. Long suffering with joyfulness. Now, we're going to, if we stand to the, to the faith, the long suffering is going to come from the outside in, but the joy is going to come from the inside. You know what? When people criticize you most of the time, we just like the world and get mad about it. We want to retaliate. <laughs> you know what? Paul and Silas, they were persecuted, weren't they not? And along about midnight, they began to give God great praise and great glory. You know why? They were joyful. They, they understood that principle. And if we as the Lord's people are going to, long, going to be able to keep going, we're going to have to quit getting upset and the mother grubs when these things happen, when people walk off and leave, when people no longer interested in the truth. Instead of getting the mother grubs, listen, be joyful and be happy because it's predicted that it would come. Giving thanks unto the Father which made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In other words, thank Him for that. Who have delivered us 
from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of His Son. Now, I want to ask you this, and this will be the emphasis of our message. Have you been translated? Now that, that word simply means changed. Translated. Move from one location to the other. Uh, uh, you can translate languages so other people can understand. Have you been changed? You know what? If I said me almost is... is Miyama uh, is Edmonolakati. Most of you would not understand what that means. My name is Brother Lafferty. You know what? It ought to be just like when you're out here in this world that you're speaking to Spanish to these people because you know what? You are to be different. You are to be translated. You are to look like a, a, a somebody with three heads to them. Just as different as daylight and dark. Be translated. Be changed. It's the very same word. Translation and change. And you know what? If you're not changed from this world, I don't have any confidence you've been born again. Because He will change you. That's your problem of Armenian doctrine. It doesn't leave any work for the Holy Ghost. It does not leave anything for to be changed because all you've done is accepted Him, whatever that means. Right? Have you been changed? You know what the best barometer of your salvation is how it's impacted your life. And if it's not impacted your life, if you don't feel any di different to the, the sin that's consumed this world, you know what? Probably you've never been born again to start with. And so we find here that as Paul is writing to this young church, what he and all this list of things that he desired from them, he wanted them to know God translated you. He changed you. He made you different. He gave you a new set of eyes. He gave you a new set of desires. He, he, he's changed things you know, what looked interesting at one time into something now that's repugnant. And if you've not experienced that, you're probably not saved. Have you had, have you, have you had that? Have you been translated or have you been uh, changed? I've had a lot of people come my way over the years and wanted me to convince them of their salvation. You know what? That's a work of the Holy Ghost. I can't do that. But I will tell you this, if whatever experience you have didn't change your life, you're probably still lost. And so then, we find that Paul gives something that's very difficult for many to, to see today. Uh, but I won't say that. It's very difficult for them to uh, embrace it because it requires a change. It requires everything, not just something. It requires Every, everything to be different. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Now, uh, I personally think that Paul was the writer of the Hebrew letter. Uh, I can't prove that. It's certainly consistent with his style of writing, but whomever, uh, whomever wrote it, he was not writing to national Israel. He was writing back to the very first church at Jerusalem, the one that the Lord Jesus Christ instituted, the one that he, the, the Lord pastored for three and a half years, and the one that Peter took over and pastored after that. He was writing to a group of believers that understood the things of God. It wasn't to the Jewish nation. A lot of people get that messed up. It wasn't to the Jewish people. It was to the Jewish believers because what they were doing was adding and heaping back in the law. And this writer said, No, no, no. You're missing the mark. You're getting off kilter. And so we find that that's what he, he is emphasizing. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 uh, in the very first verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, a lot of people say that they have faith that I wonder about. 
because their behavior don't back it up. You, you know what's the very first thing when you get that bad news from the doctor is to go before the Lord and just lay it out before Him. How many people do you know that do that though? The first thing, and I'll, I'll include myself in that pot, is this, I run to the doctor. Right? And when things uh, get worse, I look for a specialist. Instead of going to the very one that offered this body and knows all about it, knows every little thing about it, we do that. Now that's the natural emphasis of the flesh and that is, that's kind of how we're built. But I want you to see that as Paul is writing, what it really is, is a measure of your faith. Do you believe that this is real or not? See, faith is... Uh, <laughs> Faith is the missing element in the, in the modern day. We lack faith in the God that we say we serve. Now faith is the substance, the evidence, the, the fullness of the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Now what does that mean? It's a couple of things. Abraham, and he's mentioned here, I want you to go to another land, leave all this sinfulness behind, and you and Sarah go to a different place, and I'm going to give you a son. And you know what? Abraham was on the move. See, what motivated him to do that? Faith. He believed God would do it. So, if we're in this state of, uh, of immobility and of always stagnant and always staying still, what do we lack? Faith. Any, you, you know what the problem... You, you, you know, uh, the Bible says in Acts that He smited the church at Jerusalem and it scattered them. See, the, the Jews thought they were being smart and all they were was an instrument in the hand of an almighty God. And, and He scattered them everywhere. Why, why would He do that to His church? Because they weren't doing their job. Right? What were they commissioned to do? Go ye into all the world preaching the Gospel. And what were they doing? They were sitting in Jerusalem on their on their seat and do nothing. Right? You know what? You know how I motivate that one to get her room cleaned up? I tell her once and then, and, and then we go from there. Right? And, and so then, we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that, uh, that we are to be a mobile people ready, ready to move. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that there, the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now you know what? Uh, uh, I'm a creationist, creationist from the very beginning to the very end. Seven, well, six days of creation and on the seventh day He rested. And you know what? With that I say I have a degree in science and I still believe it on the full faith, on the full authority of the Word of God. And somebody says, can you prove it? No. But I have faith. And you know what? I'm excited in the last days, such as the, the, the evidence during drought that showed that there was a Red Sea crossing and there was many Romans that died in it. Or many, many Egyptians, excuse me. But you know what? I don't need that. Because I've got faith. I believe they ran across their dry shot. And I believe the sea closed and took every Egyptian out of the way. I believe that. Oh, I, I don't need scientific research to tell me that because I have faith it's true. Yeah. And, and, and that's where we as the Lord's people uh, uh, ought to be. And that's what He was saying to the Jerusalem, uh, to the church of Jerusalem, because why they lack faith. Verse... Uh, Verse number 4. 
By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. It will impact how you serve the Lord. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, by it being, by it being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated. Now, a lot of people immediately jump on this, and it does have some to do with it, that that meant from here to yonder. But you know what? Enoch had faith that translated him way before that. You know why? Because he believed God. He, uh, the, the account in Genesis says this that he was not for the Lord cooking. But it also says this, that, that he was faithful. He only lived 365 years in, in, in times when people lived eight or 900. You know why? Because he loved God so much that that was a lot more important than this. He was translated. He was a different character than the most. You know, be changed. Look different. Different, present different. That that that's that's what we as the Lord's people ought to be. We ought to be a changed, translated individual that everybody can pick up on. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. Now this is an unusual thing in Hebrews that the Genesis account really doesn't give us any information on. You know what it is to say that he was not found? Somebody had to look for him. That makes sense, right? You know what? I bet that they didn't believe Enoch was right either. I believe they thought Enoch was over the top. Man, you're taking this God thing way too far. They looked for him because they didn't believe what Enoch had to say. You know what? We live in a day and age today where in many, many situations we, we have come to the very same situation where people think that we're nuts. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Now, who did the translating? Who did the changing? Did Enoch change himself? The Bible says here God translated him. You know, that's the problem with doctrine today. And you can take all your, your uh, free willism and you can take all your Campbellitism and, and all the stuff that goes with that if you dump your chain. But no, no, the Bible says this, that God changed him. He translated him. He made the difference. And you know why? That's why the older I get, the more that I see if there's not a change in you, and uh, you can make as many professions as you want to, but if there's not a significant change, I don't have any confidence in it whatsoever. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't go out into eternity with that mess, would you? And so then we, we as the Lord's people, we want to... We want to understand and know that God makes a change and it's a change that you and I should look for. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and he was not found because God had translated him and before he, his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, if Enoch was a saved man, and I believe he was, if he was a changed man, the Bible says he was, you know what that says to me? Changed men please God. And men that don't please God, that has their, sin, has their, has their whole life laden with sin, they've just not been translated. They've just not been changed. And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand uh, this morning where the translation occurs and if we have something real or if we don't. Go with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number uh, 
1. Romans 1 and verses uh, 23 through 25. Romans chapter 1 verse 23, the Bible says this, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. You know what? You go into a Catholic church and you're going to see angels and you're going to see things of Jesus. And you know what's the sickening thing about that? Nine-tenths of them will have Jesus still nailed to a cross. You know what? Blessed be the name of God. He's not on a cross. He set that aside 2,000 years ago and He sets intervening on my behalf by His Father even today. And He is not on a cross nor will He ever be again. Amen. You know what? Uh, anything like that is an image. You know what? You don't know what angels look like. I'll give you two things on angels. First of all, they have six wings, not two. According to the Word of God, right? That's what Elijah saw. I mean, excuse me, that's what Isaiah saw. And... They can be people that just come up to you and say, I want a glass of water. You have entertained angels unaware. Mm -hmm. Right? So, when you go into these Catholic cathedrals, and very unfortunately, sometimes in many people's houses, and you see these little statues with, you know, and they may be beautiful and ornate with the two wings, you know what you're looking at? You're looking at an idol, it's idolatry. We don't have any understanding or any real knowledge of what an angel looks like except what we can find in Isaiah. And so then we find that this church at Rome, who was the defector, which of the Catholic Church grew out of, that Paul saw a lot of problems even as he's initiating the letter, who changed the glory of God, who changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, I'm not going to spend long on this, but you, have you ever heard of the, the term the vicar of Christ? That, that is the Catholic term for their priest. And that means he's their intercessor. You know what? They've made the, they've made the, the incorruptible and incorruptible image. The Catholic priest, the Catholic Pope, has no intercessory ability whatsoever. Right. You know what? I even go further. I don't think he can even pray with for you because I think he's a lost man. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I can't intercess for you, but I can pray for you because I'm a saved man. He can't even do that. And, and so we find then that, that Paul already saw the problems even at the very early stages of the church at Rome. Verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own flesh to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than, to the, more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, I want you to see that verse in 25, who changed. That is the very same word it's translated. Who changed. So when we began to change the character of God, we're committing these same sins. When you change Him to somebody that's twisting His hands, hoping that you accept Him, that's a very vile, ungodly sin. When you change the thought that God started the creation and it ran along on its own, you have changed the, the, the incorruptible into something corruptible. See, we live, we live in a day and age where it's so sinful out here, we don't even know what corruptibleness is. We really don't. But you know what? Our God is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at the same time. That's the God of the Bible. And so then we as the Lord's people, we don't need to accept anything less. We don't need to change the character of God to meet the needs of this world. We need to just trust Him. 1 Corinthians 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51, very familiar verses of Scripture. I'm not sure that they're always uh, presented the right way, but very familiar Scriptures. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51 Paul writing to the church of Corinth, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Again, that, that word translated, very same word. He says in it, he's saying in two ways. Number one, we will get put off this flesh and get a glorious new body to match the inner man. But again, if you want to know about your salvation, have you been changed? It's the very best question you can ask yourself. Have you, does your worldview differ from everybody else? And has it differed, differed since the Lord saved your soul? That's a wonderful thing to ask yourself. Uh, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, why was Enoch changed? This, this had to happen. As, as following and as careful as Enoch was, says, you know, Genesis says that he walked with God. You, you know what? To walk with God requires a nearness unto Him. We've talked about that a lot lately. That would be like me and Brother Junior walking forward and, and to be in line, I'd have to be near to Him. And the difference between Enoch and his counterparts of the day is that he walked with God, he was in line with Him, he stepped with Him. And because of that, he was translated. And as, as close as his walk with, with God was, he still had to be changed. He still had this flesh to contend with. And one day, the Lord God said, I'm going to change you. And we're going up. You know what? What a wonderful thing. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, if you've had a spiritual conversion, if you do, if you have been changed, one day you'll put this body off one of two ways. You'll be taken out of here and buried in the church cemetery, and then when He calls us out, you'll be changed. Or maybe, maybe we'll hear the last trump, and we'll go out that way, and either way you'll still be changed. You'll, you'll be transformed. So, when you're thinking about redemption, look for change. Verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, I want you to see this. The only people really that's going to experience the death swallowed up in victory is the people who are translated. Because if we're not, you're going to die. And that's not escaping. That's not escaping death. Does that make sense? Uh, Yes, you're just going to escape hell, and yes, you'll step from this world into the next, but this old body's going to die. So the only individuals are the ones that's translated. Enoch did it, Elijah did it. That's only two. What about you? You know, uh, I've often thought, am I, am I, you know what, and these people that want to predict when Christ is coming, oh, I'm not going to taste death. Listen, you don't know that. No. You just don't know that. You know what? Uh, I'm looking at Israel right now and I'm hopeful. You know, our nation saying Jerusalem is the capital. That's about turning the world up on its edge. But you know what? Keep your eye on Israel. Keep your eye on Jerusalem. Keep your eye on the Temple Mount. And you'll see some good things come to pass. But you know what? 
The thing, the things that we are seeing now, they were hoped for 125 years ago. And so then we as the Lord's people don't don't get don't get that idea, but you 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 still think, hey, I may be physically translated, I may be physically changed into the incorruptible, even in this life, and what a wonderful thing that is. But before you think about that, has your spiritual man been translated? Have you really been saved? Has the inner man changed at all? Because without a change, uh, I, I see no connection to redemption. Very last place in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. The Bible says this, But their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Now, it's hard for us to understand veils and how they inhibit the vision because we don't, we don't really use them a lot. E even in weddings today, you don't see the bride being covered very much. They might have a head covering on, but a veil obscures your vision. Uh, we've been watching some movies about uh, like a documentary about Queen Elizabeth II. And she had two individuals, a grandmother and a father, that died in, the, in these series of movies. And she wore a veil to the funeral. A black veil, just like Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis uh, wore to John Kennedy's funeral. And it obstructs the vision. Well, that's the Jew. Now, understand that. But until the Lord removes the veil, that's you too. You don't see Christ for who He is until the veil's ripped away. And then when, he, when, when the veil's ripped away and you understand the person of Christ, I guarantee you, salvation occurs. And, and so, Paul speaking of the nation of Israel, he says the, their veil is still there. Verse 15, But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their what? Heart. They don't understand it. The spiritual man is veiled in. He doesn't, he doesn't see it. He doesn't get it. Nevertheless, verse 16, Nevertheless, when it, shall, when it shall turn to the Lord, the Lord, the veil, shall be taken away. And the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Could you imagine this morning depending on the works-based salvation. You, you know what that is? It's bondage. It's not liberty. You, you, know, you know what that is? When, when you think you have to have some kind of baptismal ceremony for redemption, that's bondage. There's no liberty in that. When you have to be good all the time to be saved, you know what? I don't care if the most righteous person you know have ungodly thoughts. And, and, and you know what? But there's liberty in Christ. If you've really been saved, there is great liberty in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be able to give Him the praise and the glory that's due His name. So I ask you this morning, are you in bondage or are you free? Have you really been changed? Have you been translated? Have you ever known the person of Christ really? Uh, has the Holy Ghost ever said, this is, this is the way from the penalty of sin? Because see, if you haven't experienced that and only a preacher's told you about it, you're still lost. Right. If the Holy Ghost has never, ne never manifested Himself and all you have is logic, you know what man's logic is? It's just as corruptible as the rest of him. So if he's not spoken life, and I'm not judging nobody, but I can say this by the authority of the Word of God, if he's not spoken life, you're still lost. Had been transferred.